personal anecdote that's already been shared. But in sharing it again, it allows a question to be asked. Sometimes people would ask me, what do you see when you have people walking up your driveway carrying their baggage? And the answer that is given is, at first it was that I would see and feel the baggage and then uh, I would see God and say, well, God uh, brought them here. So they'd be invited in and you'd wade through the baggage. And then it changed. And it was that I saw God walking up uh, the driveway. And then I'd see and feel the baggage. And they would be invited in. and. We would wade through the baggage. But then it changed again, and I no longer see God walking up the driveway, nor do I see and feel the baggage. So the question that arises is, where are we when we no longer have a frame of reference for our perceptions. Where are we when we no longer have a frame of reference for our perceptions? Now perhaps you remember uh, Mola Nasruddin, that character who in the stories always manages to bluff his way out of any situation. But the truth of the matter is that uh, Mola Nasruddin was almost illiterate. He could not read or write. But one day uh, he was in town uh, when uh, a fakir one of those wandering magicians came into town uh, making an announcement. Put silver in my hand and I will teach anyone to read and write. So of course, Muller, even though he didn't want to admit that he was uh, almost illiterate, uh, quietly he went up to the fakir and put a piece of silver in his hand and and uh, allowed himself uh, to be in the hands of the fakir, who uh, immediately uh, said a few incantations over him, mumbled some words, and then sent him on his way. Well, a couple of days later, Mullah Nasruddin came running into town waving a book in the air saying, where is that fakir? Where is that fellow? I want to see him. I want to get my money back. And the people in the town said to the mullah, well, can you read and write? And the mullah said, yes, I can read and write. And this book says that all fakirs are charlatans and frauds. I want my money back. <laughs> Then there's that story about uh, the great scholar in uh, England. And he had a vast library and a number of students, but uh, he was old. And uh, when he passed away, he bequeathed his library to his favorite student. Well, his favorite student was delighted to go through all of these worthy terms, knowledge, history, and mathematics, and all the other scholarly arts. But uh, this student happened to be a little bit of a, uh, a despot, you know, he liked to tipple a little bit, as some of these English people like to do. And um, so he decided to sell all the whole library and make as much money 
as he could. Um, and as it so happened, amongst the, that vast library, there was this strange looking book with a rather plain cover, although it did have some several hieroglyphics on it. And uh, these books have found their way uh, onto various bookshelves around the world, as it happened. And it so happened that uh, another scholar came into the bookstore one day and his eyes were drawn to this strange looking term. So he took it home with him and after reading it, he found that amongst the strange hieroglyphics that were there were certain codes embedded in the writing. And uh, these codes evoked kind of sounds in one. So he decided that he would experiment <coughs> with this. So in his experimentation, with his incantations according to the hieroglyphics in the book, he found himself in a different time, long ago. <coughs> And to his very great surprise, in his awareness, with those things that he perceived and experienced, he found that that which was written in the history books was not actually what happened. So he became very confused because he was a teacher of history and here he was having the experience that all the things that the book said were not valid at all. So he started to teach in a new way but most people shunned what he was teaching and he became a pariah because people only wanted to believe what was in the books. So he had to give up his teaching, but as it happened, he was in a faraway place. So taking this book, which had really become a curse to him, it had changed his life so drastically, he threw it out of the window. And it happened to land in the feet of this man who himself had a stall in the flea market selling bits and bobs of all kinds of things. So he picked up the book and he took it along to his flea market and put it on his table. And as it happened, another young man came by, a, a tourist uh, again from London, and he took this book and when he took it home and opened it up and he saw these strange looking hieroglyphs. He was very, very intrigued by it, but he was a good Catholic lad. So he decided he better not delve into any of its contents until he went to his uh, bishop and uh, asked his advice. So he took the book along to his bishop and mentor and showed the bishop the book and the bishop just said, no, shun this volume, shun this pagan tome. And so uh, taking the advice of his bishop, uh, the young man left the book with the bishop and left. But then uh, the bishop, uh, picking up the book from uh, the table, uh, opened it up and was reading the hieroglyphics and the different codes that were there. And he thought to himself, well, I am such a pious being. I could not be touched by any kind of magic. I'll just uh, try and see what happens. So he... Uh, reading the hieroglyphics and intoning uh, the sounds that were there. Suddenly he felt himself uh, almost flying through the 
head at great speed. And all of a sudden, he found himself in a place high up in the mountains. But behind him, there was an open cave, and out of the cave were coming these strange sounds, grunts and snorts and all kinds of things. So he thought he would <coughs> go in and explore this, and when he went in there, there were these uh, strange, hairy-looking creatures wearing uh, wearing sh skins of various animals and all. And he thought to himself, well, well, these are obvious, ignorant people, and I have been sent here to teach them the word. So he set to to teach him the ways that he had been taught and what he had known. He got so absolutely caught up in this task that he completely forgot the sounds that would bring him back into his present. And as far as we know, he's still there now. <laughs> And as so far as the book is concerned, well, it's no doubt on some shelf somewhere or on some flea market table for some unsuspecting soul to come along and see what it does for them. So recognizing that all these stories are just a chemistry, creating an alchemy. How do these stories fit in to this question that's been posed to you? Where are we when we no longer have a frame of reference for our perception? Where are you now? When somehow the conditioning, the ideas, the concepts, the knowledge, with the events of life, have brought us to a state where we can no longer make sense of it. We have nothing that we can stand on. A frame of reference. Not conditioning, not enculturation, not belief. Where are we? Where do we stand? Is it like a dark room where we try desperately to use the senses that have fed us well when we're in the light and we stumble around bumping into things? Where are we? 